guess it's welcome to 2019 for the first uh, meeting of the year. Um, I had a couple of housekeeping things, and the, and the first one was to um, welcome. Uh, you go by Laurie or Lorene? I go by Laurie. Laurie. So Laurie Bora, uh, who's the new Parks and Rec uh, chairman, um, okay. placing Mary Flynn. So um, you're welcome to come to each and every meeting, which uh, Mary, Mary right, came to. Calendar. Mary came to a good bunch of them, and then sometimes she'd be busy, but. Uh, Love the participation. That's great. Are, are you on the, uh, the let's see the, the committee? I guess as the chair, you're also on the committee for Parachute Point, right? That, I'm an ex officio member of that. Is that how it works? That's, yeah. Okay. We've got all these extra duties. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got but our the eyes. Pay is great. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we've got our eyes and ears uh, via Tom on that. Yes. But uh, we certainly have a high interest in the uh, field watch right there. So that's a yes. continuum. Uh, Thing of interest for Having almost lost my car into it one time. That's exactly. Crazy. That's exactly it. <laughs> You've seen the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen the movie. Just waiting for our time. <laughs> so, um, so um, I thought we'd just do some housekeeping things. Um, and the first thing is uh, November 19th, uh, uh, meeting minutes, uh, Harari approved it in the last year. Too big a gap to sit and wait, so don't have to do that. Um, and then just some uh, housekeeping things. So we have a couple new roles, or one new role, or sort of a couple. First is um, our rotating clerk system is still working for the uh, this year, and Eric is it clearly on the sites. I did my last right at the end of the last year. I think I'm clear now. So that's super. Does the chairman actually even have to do it? No, exactly. No, no you're no. you're exa yeah, yeah. you're exa <laughs> exa <laughs> duty pay. I got my last hit in December, and and that's it for the year. So I'm, I'm super happy. So. But that'll keep going around, and so um, I think the next Dave is yourself. And as the system worked last year, um, the next person and the person after that need to coordinate if the next person is not going to be there. Okay. That's our sort of agreement. So, David, for some reason you can't do it for the next meeting, then David Kahn is squarely in the, in the batting cage, or at the plate. So if we can keep that system, just whoever's designated, think of the person ahead if you've got some issue. Um, but on a more permanent role, we've got uh, Rob here acting as the clerk, um, and he isn't responsible for taking notes, but he's responsible for uh, prompting them and uh, receiving them for you and filing them and the agendas and all the other things that the clerkship uh, entails. Um, so we've got it a little bifurcated, but that makes it a little easier on everybody. So, so thanks for picking that up. That's great. Absolutely. And on the, the vice chair position, so that's sort of... Uh, um, uh, not much to say on that. Uh, there's not an appointment of the vice chairman. So how we've decided to handle it, um, and this is okay by the town, is to just keep it vacant for a while. Uh, there's a couple aspects of that. Um, one, no one was really wanting to jump into it. So it hurt my feelings. <laughs> um, but, but the other is, I, I think, you know, there's not a real need for it. I think uh, if you um, want to fill the vice chair, let it be a person who starts to do a lot of activity that you know sort of naturally becomes the vice chair. Um, so through I think activity and desire um, of, of a person on the commission, and I think any one of you would be a great candidate should you sort of hop into that mold. Uh, we'll fill it as time goes on. Um, or if no one wants to do it, we'll just sort of see how it gets handled. Yeah, the only um, as practical matter historically, the only time that has actually been necessary is when if the chairman can't make a meeting and the vice chair can chair the meeting. Um, and so uh, I think we just, uh, I guess we have to kind of think through the actual logistics of that, whether a another board member, commission member is authorized, you know, with Kate, a yeah, no, it's a battlefield good, promotion. To you're, you're precisely on a Kate Bush, the town administrator who I bounced this yeah. off, said that we needed to handle just that. But she didn't specify if it needed to be a standing um, person or not. Um, We've done that in Parks and Rec. Have you? Yeah. yeah how to stand? Mary, a couple times, just asked me to stand in for her. Okay. And you weren't vice chair of the commission. Does not have a vice chair. So okay. you could sort of do maybe, as, as I got sick or something came on, I could do a roving call and see if <laughs> a frightful call from Bill. <laughs> well, so we'll, we'll figure out how we handle that um, as time comes up. Um, just passed around is the schedule for this year. Um, so we are on the eight sessions, uh, and we have a gap um, 
we do this month, but we don't then meet again until April. I'm not quite remembering our reasoning on that, but that's where, that's where we are. Um, and there, I mean, historically, there just hasn't been that much going on in the colder months. That yeah, so it made sense. And uh, I think we also talked about, you know, I think um, the meetings are always helpful to know what everyone's doing, but um, you know, sometimes there's not enough on the agenda to warrant it. So um, if not enough comes up, I think I'm game for one or two to be dropped, as we all talked about. I, I think that would be the max, though, because there's some value just to seeing our faces and thinking of things to talk about it if nothing has come up. So. Um, anyway, so there's the schedule. I think you all have um, soft copies of it also. And let's see, lastly on the uh, logistics side, I um, wanted to make sure we had everybody's updated contact info. So I'm going to uh, actually set, I'll send out an email, um, just left my phone in the car, but I'll just hit everybody so I can just copy and paste that into the old one. Yeah, super. So, just, um, well, it really hasn't changed except for yourself, right? Although right. well, the list, list is minus some people. I don't know if yeah, got a current list changed. in hand. It's the contact information we're keeping is primarily phone and email information, right? Is it home address? Yeah, what's home address? Okay. Also. So <laughs> mine has changed, so. Um, okay. But the point of question, and I guess more than somebody should ask the question, because we're a town committee, <coughs> Uh, I think we need to have town email addresses. You, you're right, and I'm actually cognizant cognizant of that. And as I've been emailing people around, to be honest, I haven't you've been using mine because I've got already like three or four other email addresses. Um, you know, we should be doing that. I don't know what to say. If it's practical for you all to get that up on your, I, I don't think. I don't think. Practicality is the I issue. Think it's, it's not meant to be. I agree. Yeah. It's it's required. Yeah. Well, here's I was going to bring this up at the end, but this jump starts it. So, on some of the other commissions, like your commission, um, there are email addresses. Yeah. Which I think is great. You know, we sit here sort of quiet, and if people in the town want to outreach to us, I think it'd be pretty important that they be able to get a hold of us. And you have to put email addresses, and we're certainly not going to put our personal Gmails there. Well, it's also for legal reasons. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, I have one, so I'm <coughs> I know, I'm okay. So <laughs> I, I think we all we, were all we all issued, should have one. We were all issued um, yeah. email addresses. Yeah. I believe you're required to use them, and also if you've ever been subject to an FOI request, which I was when I was in the Board of Finance, and that was before we were all really using them, and they can come in and here you look at all your personal email. It you really opens you up to the other yeah, side. You, yeah. Um, so we might as well bite the bullet and. Start doing that, and my, my suggestion again is we can talk about this more. But is that we, we put them up on the website so that if you meet someone at a party and you talk about an issue and they want to get a hold of you afterwards, they can remember the name because they won't always reach out to me or somebody else if they don't don't know me. But um, I just think it'd be handy because we sit here sort of quietly and we should be getting input from people when they desire. So, I don't know. Do, do people object to putting? email addresses? The I think the only challenge was that you had to reset the password every so often and if you had it on your phone it just kind of stopped working. Uh, it was uh, kind not of cumbersome. But not anymore. I've had my password uh, for the Harbor Master since I started. Yeah. I think they fixed that issue. Okay. It doesn't. Yeah, I mean if you if you I mean, have to reset big. the password it's kind of, there's, the, the practical reality is there's so actually little traffic that this commission Tends to get on email. It's business, you know, this business related to the other than setting up our meetings. Um, right. That if you have to cheat, keep track of your passwords, then it's kind of yeah, administratively burdensome. But if you don't have to do that, then I, th I think this the town put in a new password protection system or whatever the proper term is. Um, even in my corporate world, I've been there three years and I haven't changed the password because they. Got a new password scheme thing. Towns and governments have to abide by what's known as NIST standards, uh, uh, National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology, and so they have to change it every 90 days. I've never changed my. Well, the Is that because your state? Gov government, government has to. No, my email's there and there. And you're out of code. <laughs> uh, nobody's told me to change it. I mean, I don't get reminders to change it, so. All right. Don't either. Well, so 
let's I'll talk to George about from it. here on forward then let's all get on our Darien CTs .govs and I'm afraid that you maybe really have somebody from town IT maybe because I've Reach long out. since forgotten what mine is and <laughs> When we set these up, the guy was very helpful. And we also, you know, we have this Google Docs central drive, and he was very helpful for that. Um, we don't use them enough to remember all the processes, but um, I've forgotten the Google Docs. I haven't been on it for like five months. He, Eric, is it possible to give it to Rob and he can send yeah. it out to the team if he Absolutely. makes that request? Yeah, that'd be great. Because I have opened my email since I joined. So. Yeah. <laughs> There's just not that much traffic yeah. that would go on it. You need to do something controversial. Can, can, can you, can you, would it be uh, within code to do both? So that, like, when we send missives out, people get them on their official and they get them. Yep. The only problem with that, Bill, is if you do both, your personal email is subject to FOI. It goes back, and that's the point. Yeah. And it, it technically, you know, you may forget to copy, you know, if you send it to Bill Cavers at Gmail or something, and then you forgot to copy Bill Cavers at DC, at Darien CT. That's the one who's going to get in trouble. Yep. All right. Well, so there you go. We need directive on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, whatever. That's fine. I don't got anything to buy anymore. So. <laughs> we'll talk about that next week. It's your FDK. <laughs> yeah. But it does have practice. It poses challenges because people, like, I've got a meeting on a Wednesday night, and, you know, a bunch of people haven't confirmed yay or nay, and I know this. Mm -hmm. Because they don't aren't. look at that email. They're not in the habit of just looking at it. So, I mean, I'm not going to say it doesn't close. Well, again, if you set it up in your phone, it's great. But if you just... set up in your phone, yeah. I've just got mine on my phone, and you can just, it merges right in with your other emails. And... Got it to be, oh, that's how you get it on, a, on a, the overall, it blends yeah. in with others. Yeah. yeah. I don't tend to do that because I don't like my, well, anyway. Yeah. All right. Good. So, we all heard that. Um, so I'll just jump into some chairman items here um, before we get to Harvard Masters and Shellfish. So um, we did a new form of year-end report um, for the town uh, annual fiscal year report. A copy of that's going around. Um, poor Flip's format was changed. <laughs> well, everybody. I know. Yeah. He, they wanted us to do it in two skinny columns. Um, and uh, emphasize more projects. So we took a little of the description that had been in prior years, and it was a little little different. Um, and if you look through this, we, we emphasize the good, first was water quality, so the good wise river testing, which I think has really been quite successful, um, and, and it's fine, as well as uh, giving us information uh, generally about our waters. Um, and the, United, the Unified Water Study, and then um, Tom, we put in the channel survey as our third item. And then David's shellfish um, work we, uh, had a good uh, reference in there to the outreach David's done to the townsfolk to try to get the clamming uh, easier to access with licenses and that sort of thing. And then we sort of the last um, paragraph did a bunch of miscellaneous items. And uh, actually, that was um, not meant to be just a throw in, it was meant to be showing that. Uh, we are monitoring the range of activities for different stakeholders out there. And I think, you know, to the extent we're not making decisions on every meeting, um, that's not always the, the, the um, importance of what we're doing. We're sitting here and making sure there's not a, an area in which we need to make a decision or bring the town involved. So, um, so that last paragraph showed it. And then we had a couple of nice pictures. First one's some sea smoke, courtesy of Flip. Very nice. <laughs> Um, it was like one of four. You sent each one more beautiful than the other, yeah. but the, that one got it, I think. And then if you've ever wondered what the Coastline Consulting um, Survey boat looks like, that's them in action as they pulled out of the boat launch area. Anyway. Uh, and then a, just a quick thing. on uh, uh, had a meeting David Kahn and I did with uh, Jamie Stevenson. Um, this was back in uh, early December. Um, purpose was twofold. One, just to highlight some of the things that David's been doing, again, with the shellfish. Um, I think uh, <coughs> we thought it was important for her to know you've been fairly active. We've gotten the sign up. Um, you're working with uh, freight on a number of things in Pramer. Um, there's a lot of 
um, town interface that we're trying to do with that. And I think it's a real healthy area for us to keep on growing. And so it was good to socialize her to what uh, we've been up to there. And I think she, I think she enjoyed that talk. Um, and she sees Roger Freight periodically, so it <laughs> gives her some more background on what we're trying to do. Uh, and then the, the uh, other thing we, we um, had gone up there to talk to her about um, is try to get a little feel for what she would like to do on the nutrient, the excess nutrient side, the um, non um, uh, source pollution side. And uh, you know, just sort of t testing how enthusiastic she is about us going inland, if you will. So it's very obvious when there's these algae blooms and excess uh, macrophytes uh, seaweed on the surface that we, we get concerned. But how much can we do about it um, all over the town and how do we go about it? So I was um, seeking her sort of advice on how much we should embrace this and who we might outreach to. Um, and we had a good, I think, reaction from her. She said that it's certainly a vineyard mandate. Um, so, you know, where I express, um, honestly, a little frustration sometimes of where our skill set goes upstream, you know, how, how do we affect all the uh, nutrient loading that happens upstream when we're harbor focused, if you will. Um, you know, she encouraged us to be creative that way. So that, that was a nice thing to hear. Um, and uh, the, the other aspect, she said she thought the Environmental Protection um, uh, was a committee um, would be uh, a place to talk. Uh, what's the fellow's name? I'm forgetting. Um, Eric Justin. 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 Yeah. Um, and I, I've been going back and forth with him and haven't succeeded. I, I'm not quite sure if that's an exact match of what we're doing, um, but uh, we'll reach out to him and again see where we can stitch together whatever other um, committee or commission or agency department in the town is interested in working with us. So, um, so that was that. Um, we'll just keep try to keep her informed periodically on what we're up to. Um, and then I just had a couple things I was going to run through. So the Long Island Sound um, uh, Committee, this is the Long Island Sound Study, the Citizens Advisory uh, Commission. This is something <coughs> Flip has been going to via his uh, seat as chairman of this commission. And then he uh, said, you know, take it over. And uh, so I went there and I had been to these like three or four years ago when Sandy McDonald ran the group and um, uh, would toss them out periodically. It was, it was a fairly interesting meeting. So it's, it's headed by um, uh, Holly Drinkuth. Yeah, thank you. Um, and there's a vice chair also whose name I'm just not remembering right now. But uh, it took place up in, uh, in mid-December, and this was up in uh, New Haven, I believe. Could be wrong on that. It was uh, Bridgeport. Bridgeport. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I was just going to mention a couple things. Um, so uh, they were excited about something called the National... Um, Estuarian Research Reserve, uh, and that is, I'm just going to pass this around, um, something I wasn't aware of, but apparently uh, Connecticut, it's just a three-pager, uh, apparently Connecticut uh, was either invited or had an opportunity to designate some of our uh, nature preserves along our shores for this NERR designation, and um, it, it it's very bureaucratic. It doesn't change the designation as like a Connecticut preserve into a federal preserve. What it does, though, is allow a whole bunch of federal grants and research um, opportunities to be focused on the area. So Sarah Crosby was extraordinarily excited. She said, this is bureaucracy, but you don't get it. This is going to unleash all sorts of focus on our coastal waters, at least in these areas, um, and, and unlock monies that we'll have access to. So she was tremendously excited. And there's a, a grouping of um, areas that I think I included the map on in the last page there that are being put forward, they were in December, um, to the uh, EPA. Um, and if, I guess, it succeeds, they'll be declared National Est Estuarian, I can't pronounce that, Estuary Research Reserves, and, and again, that will unleash a lot of new study dollars that uh, should help out. So, so again, uh, the, the science folks seem extraordinarily excited about that, so it's interesting. Um, another thing that uh, was brought up, uh, and I haven't been following this at all, and I, I thought this was a, um, we, we should have, I think, maybe been a little on this during the last year, but the, the sea walls, uh, sea barriers that have been proposed in New York Harbor and up the, um, uh, up the East River um, have been moving forward. And uh, 
in the Long Island Sound study meeting, they mentioned that uh, there have been uh, a number of battles taking place where uh, Save the Sound and some of the other environmental groups have been saying, hey, slow this process down. And apparently the study period to start working on this thing has been extended from three years to six years, and there's been six million dollars was origi originally uh, um, allocated to study the potentially harmful effects of the sea bears is now 19.4. So that extra study dollars and time was all as a result of people yelling and shouting. And I, I guess there's, there's two forms of it. One would uh, put a sea, well, sorry, not more. There's like six or so forms of this, but two major things. And the simple thing, which would be uh, a sea barrier across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge and at the Throgs Neck Bridge. And the other is um, those plus a trillion other barriers and seawalls and levees and sort of increased gradations. For what purpose? This is all for um, storm and uh, uh, flooding uh, containment. So, um, so Mother Nature decides it's time to flood. Hard to believe that we can do that. Billions and billions of dollars. <clears throat> but, but I think that, you know, the thing that I, I wish that we sort of were watching a little more is, you know, I guess if this stuff doesn't have the local communities shouting about the proper things to pay attention to, you know, it just could steam, uh, steam roll forward in some a year. So anyway, there's a lot of environmental groups all over it, and, and there's been a change. Um, the, the last thing worth mentioning was, um, this is something Flip, you mentioned, uh, uh, turf and fertilizer management. So this is, this is where I wonder if we get like a little upstream sometimes. But, but we had a talk by a guy named Tom Morris, who's a Yukon professor, you've probably heard of him, but he focuses all on turf, and turf with regard to what's healthy turf, what for healthy turf fertilization practices to reduce nitrogen runoff. So he gave us a half hour talk on turf, which, you know, um, he made fairly interesting. It's, you know, on the face of it, it's not the most interesting topic, but he had a lot of scientific research. And like I just had two big takeaways from it, which I thought made the whole thing worthwhile. You know, we wonder what we can do as a commission with fertilizer runoff, um, and can there be some effect we have? Well, he we said that the two biggest gains for pulling back on, on nitrogen uh, is to um, uh, pull back uh, on the fall, the, the timeline at which people fertilize in the fall. So if you don't do that last fertilizing, let's say that's in late September, early October, but you, you just say forget it, so your last one's maybe at end of August, he said that's huge because that end fertilizing doesn't go into the growth, it actually gets washed away. So that's the, like the biggest gain you can have if you just have a town agree to not fertilize past a given date. So that maybe is obvious to other people, but I was struck by that means we could do something with education efforts in town. And he said the second biggest gain is to uh, put fertile, uh, excuse me, instead of fertilizer, put your clippings into your lawn. Um, I've been doing that for about 25 years with my mulching mower, but maybe others aren't. So he thought those were the two biggest uh, gains that could be made against uh, nitrogen intents, and both to me are reachable by education. So I thought that was sort of exciting. Yeah, Lori, I don't know if you've heard about this issue much at all, but it actually does have relevance to Parks and Rec, because um, one of the biggest fields in town is right down the hill here, it is Parks and Rec field, I believe, and that abuts right onto Stony Brook. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it, uh, when it, when you get a downpour event, the, you know, the water kind of runs off it in a sheet into Stony Brook, and that's mm -hmm. part of the flooding issue, but with that sheet of water comes all the fertilizer residues. Um, and so even as a demonstration property, you could think of using that field to both, and, and I don't know what the town's um, fertilizing schedule is for that field, but if it runs into the fall, you could consider pairing that back uh, and then one thing that has also been discussed is not, you know, leaving a, just as an example, 50-foot edge along the side of the stream unmowed or with only a small kind of path down to the stream so that it, it's not as quite as easy for everything to run right into the river. Um, which term of art for that? Just buffer? Or? 
Yeah, it's like a riparian buffer, if you want. A term, term of art. Very technical term. But it's basically an unmowed portion of, of the <clears> field. <throat> uh, so those are two things that you could consider. And um, maybe if people thinks it, think it makes sense, we could connect this professor at UConn and get even sort of a, a game plan of what would be ideal or optimal. Well, I had a question. Would people like them to come down? Is this a, I mean, we can reach out to them in other ways, but would this be of interest enough to have them at the commission meeting talking for 20 or 30 minutes? I mean, you don't have to say yes, but I mean. I think it would be interesting. Yeah. We'll open up to the town. Yeah, well, that's, that would be a good, <coughs> not just us. Good strategy to do. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, this is where we're a little bit like you know we're all harbor focused. If thinking of turf makes some people. Yeah. You know, what, did you, what did you say his name was? Uh, Morse. Uh, Tom Morse from UConn. M O R I. M O R. You know I'm not sure I spelled it M O R I S S. I'm not sure. He's a good speaker though. He's just entertaining. He goes around and does this quite regularly, uh, big topics. So, um, my wife works at the Canaan Library, and uh, they're all interested in sustainability, and we're inquiring about someone to talk about turf. So, um, I gave my wife his name. But uh, anyway, uh, another thing which is sort of interesting. Um, so. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, TNC, has been outreaching, if you know a lot, on the Blue Plan, Connecticut Blue Plan. And I'm forgetting how I got a call from them. It was probably from meeting up with Holly at the meeting down here um, when she came and talked. But um, the Blue Plan wanted to come and talk to people in Darien, so they just approached me and asked, can we come and talk to people? So um, I was uh, definitely yes. So I nabbed them for our April 8 meeting. They're going to be here and explain to us the Connecticut Blue Plan, which is a, if you, all of you don't know, it's sort of a big planning and zoning device. You know, really bureaucratic, sort of a big process, laying everything out, the various stakeholders and the uses and mapping things out. Um, but it's, it's quite comprehensive, and it mirrors what's being done on the oceans and coastlines all up and down our, our, our country these days. People are trying to plan. So um, it, it's really sort of neat that way. And it's a neat website they created, which has a lot of, um, uh, like different stakeholder interests, you can say, you know, where, where it's already up online if you look at it. Like, where, where do people sail? Where do people motorboat? You put in the clicks and you see all the GIS data. It's pretty, pretty fascinating that way. Um, but I, I went farther and I asked that they wanted this to, the April 8 meeting, that they'd come and talk to us to also be a town wide meeting. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. Then they went to the idea of a region wide interest, a region wide uh, meeting, and I thought that was pretty interesting too goes beyond this room. So I said, um, why don't I secure you the Darien Library, the big community room, and you can do a region-wide meeting there, and then also do our just you know commission meeting here, which we'll advertise, and it's, it's always open to the town also. Um, so we will, that April 8 could be a bigger meeting with more people attending here, but there'll also be a region-wide uh, meeting May 9 in the Darien Library. And um, we're not meant to help um, advertise for it or anything, that's all their business. Um, but I thought we could help in town to the extent we could um, call friends and clubs and uh, you know, as we approach that I'll remind people and maybe we can just get our side of the equation in that room. But we'll, you know, us folks will already have put them on people like ourselves. So. Lori or Tom, can I just ask in terms of the parks and rec planning process for both um, obviously Pear Tree Point, which mm -hmm. is underway, uh, but also to just thinking more generally about Weed Beach and all the properties down there. How much has uh, sea level rise sort of studies factored into kind of the discussion of, of what scenarios are likely or not likely over the next number of decades? It definitely was a discussion point when we interviewed the consultants for Pear Tree because most of the firms, it was funny, each of the firms we interviewed was a little different, but there was definitely a lot of focus on coastal engineering and living shorelines and that that was really a big piece of the project. Because so the complaint we're getting, of course, is that people complain about the sand being dirty. Well, the sand is dirty because the sand ends up on the parking lot all the time and then it gets brushed back down. So. 
it's really a lot of the project is not just like what do we do with the bathhouse or here or there. It's really a lot of discussion and the firm that we hired has a lot of experience in planning for shoreline restoration and sustainability. So that's absolutely a big piece of the project. Would you agree, Tom? Yes, ma'am. And a real focus of the group. Um, you know, we <coughs> each, not as much, we actually are going to be presenting plans at the meeting Wednesday night to finish out the, what everybody calls the short lane property. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the plans are largely for uh, wetlands, some movement of the wetlands, getting rid of the bad wetlands, and you actually can move wetlands, putting good ones in. We're really looking at mostly just grassing that over. There's a big dip connecting it to the beach and putting in a few walkways and whatever. So, um, you know, very basic. And because that end of the property, definitely we're seeing a lot of the sand going up and over where there's a wall now right. and moving in. And people in the Bay generally are saying they're seeing more flooding than they used to. Yeah, because, because many of these groups that Bill is referring to are very focused on what I call longer term sea level mm -hmm. rise. but. I think that it might be fair to characterize that most of them would underwrite to a sort of 24-inch rise in the next mm -hmm. 30 years sort of thing, scenario. And it's, as you think about our town <coughs> waterfront, <coughs> including the beaches, if you actually had that scenario, yeah. like it's a whole different world down it is. On, it the, definitely on is. the waterfront. I mean, one of the questions I asked all of the consultants was, you know, what was the town's risk to doing nothing? Because there's always the concerns we come up with these great plans and, you know, the money isn't made available or there's constituents who, for whatever reason, don't like the plans. But we pretty consistently heard is with that parcel, if you do nothing, you will lose it. It's gone. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the answer. It, it will be gone. Given that over time. flooded at high tide already. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I know right before Christmas I was getting videos from people. Uh, it was maybe the 23rd or so. Mm. And there was literally like wave action right out to the guardhouse. Right. <clears throat> we were we drove through yesterday. It was it was pretty well flooded. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. Mm. So that is a big you know big piece of it. But there's going to be a lot of discussion. Uh, one technique is um, adding dunes, like was done down at Weed Beach. Personally, <clears throat> I think the dunes are fabulous. A lot of people don't like them. But well, what does that do for flooding of the parking lot? It prevents it. What comes in, does it come, yeah, come around, around the back? Not so but much at Weed Beach. We're really not having trouble with flooding at the parking lot anymore. But the pear tree's got a different right. problem. Is it's got an L-shaped beach. Right. So we'll have to look at that. Mm -hmm. But but that's one thing. You can build walls as well. But you know, to the extent we can do things that are natural, you know, probably that's the way we want to go. But. If you are build you, it up, you are, they, know, are you considering just raising, like raising the parking lot level? The consultants no. pretty much ruled that out. Ruled that out. The state would it. the state would never allow it. Um, it doesn't really provide any tremendous benefit. Um, Higher. They just <laughs> added the boat ramp in Norwalk. They raised the whole thing. Yeah. As, as we interviewed the consultants, they pretty much uniformly interviewed three different groups, and they pretty much all said that's not really going to be an option was, for it you. It was more of a state or federal issue or anything so that's like a zoning right. land use issue rather than on nature's going to wipe it out or not think it works they, 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 oh, i think the, the gist of it was they didn't really think it would gain anything about it and it was incredibly expensive but we've just now selected the consultants they're really just i think we're under the contract phase right now and then they're going but these will be a big part of the discussion it's just really just to property. connect one dot in the kind of hypothetical land depending on how fast the project moves forward. Mm -hmm. If we ever get to a point where we have to dredge the harbor again, mm -hmm. which it's not clear when that would be, it might at some point be a very good place to get rid of the spoils, mm -hmm. to put them on the parking lot and raise it. Um, I mean, it, in terms of that's a possible connection of the dot if you were, if you had the time right. and the need. I mean, um, the project will probably take beginning to end a couple of years, but yeah. I mean, we're planning to keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Yep. That's probably too simple. Unless we want a deeper harbor, we'll throw it into the budget. <laughs> on, on that, just to, so I just have a couple of uh, uh, notification things and I'll wrap up. Uh, so there's a sea level rise talk, 6.30 p.m. Darien Library, April 4th. Um, and that is uh, uh, the head of Save the Sound of 
Oh, sorry, what's his name? Kurt Johnson. Kurt Johnson will be talking about that along with others, so that looks sort of interesting. Yeah, including the guy who's the head of the University of Connecticut's Sea Level Rise Preparedness Institute. Can't be more right on. So. Um, and so it'll be a busy week for you because that's Thursday and then Friday, April 5. Um, if anyone wants to go, this is the Connecticut Deep Volunteer Water Monitoring Program News. Uh, sorry, that's the thing that sends out the, um, the advertisement for this. It's the 2019 Connecticut Volunteer Water, Water Monitoring Conference. So if I don't go there, I'm totally a mess. But, uh, so I, I, I just, um, I suspect this will be full of um, uh, citizen science people, so people have signed up for the UWS uh, Water Quality Sampling Program. Um, but also there's a lot of lakes and rivers and wetlands that apparently there's a lot of uh, water quality sampling going on, and that is meant to cover um, those people also. So this could be fairly interesting, anyone who's got an inkling to get involved in, in the water quality sampling, or just to know a little more what we're talking about here, like on the excess nutrient non-point source stuff. Um, that seems to be a conference that will... Um, address it for a whole day. And the only other thing I was going to mention, thing caught my eye, um, apparently there has been the ability for uh, commercial fishermen to go in and with uh, purse seines, which I think are big nets that close up at the back, uh, fish from Manhattan on the New York side of Long Island Sound. Connecticut's long, out, long since outlawed that. Um, but New York is not, and last year there were some boats from Virginia that came up, commercial fishermen, and actually were um, scooping up Manhattan off um, the uh, Verrazano Narrows Bridge near York Harbor. Lower. And so they technically could have come up into the Sound, but the New York legislature just passed a law which is being signed into a... Hey, Frank. Frank? Fun. I, I could join you, and you could join me if they are jam. <laughs> I'd rather be here. Please. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's uh, just, I get, uh, just passed the legislature and it's being signed into law as we speak, or already has been. Um, that's just sort of neat because, the, as I think I understand this, the, the Manhattan or what are, and, and the growth in their populations are what are bringing in the porpoise and the uh, humpback whales and some of the, I think, a minke whale or two that have been seen over the last three or four years. So uh, nice to sort of see there's another um, layer of protection against... It seemed like there were many fewer this year than there totally, were. Totally, totally. I mean, you That's didn't see them around the boat club. I, I, my office sits in the Saugatuck River, and last year they were probably so thick you could have walked across them. I feel like I didn't see any of this. There were a lot <coughs> out in the main bios or sound. The you The Menhaden. Bunker. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. The what? There were a, a Menhaden or, or Bunker. bunker. The, the fish in those big schools. You can see um, the little fins. And oh. you literally can there were a lot them. out in the core of the sound that were not, they, they for whatever reason didn't come into Goodwise River mm -hmm. as, much, as much this year. Um, I don't know why, but there were a lot out, okay. farther out. I, 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 yeah, but um, it, it was, the prior years it was just all over. It was, you know, by Ziegler's, by Fish, by in our coves, I mean, out farther in the sound. Yeah. Uh, there this. was a lot, I mean, looking from Long Lake Point East on a calm day, you would see 20 or 30 schools of them just swimming around. They, they were there, I think they were just deeper or something. Yeah, they were around, I mean, by my morning, right at the entrance of Ziggler's, they would run every once in a while, but not in the, in the in the volume that you used. Yeah, they didn't come into the harbor as quite as much out of the way. I've been kayaking them where you don't paddle, you just float in, and literally they would separate, you know, five feet either side, but I'd be surrounded by literally thousands of fish. I'm just absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah. Grant asked an interesting question. Has anybody seen any seals in the harbor this winter? I've looked at it, but they're mostly out on the Smith's Reef, right? That's where, that's the only place I've ever seen them. I've, I've looked at binoculars, but I haven't seen them out there. Three, four, I, I haven't looked at them. Uh, a friend of mine sent me a picture of a baby harbor seal in uh, Westport, the uh, yeah, Westport the other day, um, but I haven't seen much action mm -hmm. down here. I bought a dry suit last year for going out, and I just don't want to do it. <laughs> 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 Wait another month or two. Yeah. <laughs> um, just last up, uh, we've talked about getting more speakers in here. Um, I was going to tell you a couple of the people I've got in, but I'm still working on others. And if you guys have ideas or um, 
making contact with people, please help out. Uh, but I've been back and forth with the East Coast Kelp Farms, J.P. Velotti. So this is the kelp farm off of Sheffield uh, that's owned by Bloom. Uh, at least he's an investor in it. And so I'd, I'd like him to come in and talk to us about what he's doing out there and uh, are the buoys going to get any bigger and more prevalent. Um, there's a lot of them out there right there's now. A, there's a lot of them, yeah. Um, interesting. So I'd just like to know what that's all about. And likewise, um, I have secured a Kendall Barbary. Um, she's with an outfit called Green Wave. And Green Wave is interesting. They're a... Um, I think the term would be incubator rather than accelerator, incubator of kelp farms up and down the East Coast. So um, they've got some funding to um, actually give lessons to, not, not financial help, but lessons and technical support and uh, legal support to, to help um, aspiring kelp farmers secure a piece of water in Connecticut waters and develop a kelp farm. So we're going to have her come in and give us a talk on what that means and how many people they're talking to, and are, is that something we're going to have to be dealing with in the near future off Arco, 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 Arco. Yeah, I don't. Are the buoys? Sorry, are, are the buoys uh, to the west of Darien Harbor, like over by Stam towards Stamford? Yes. The, is that a kelp farm no, too, no, or are those oysters? That's oysters. Those are oysters. Yeah. yeah so those are racks that are down on the bottom and buoys that oh, go up to the surface. Um, the only kelp farm around here is to the south of the western tip of um, Sheffield Island, sort of hidden. There's a series of rocks over there yeah. that's sort of hidden in behind the rocks. So it's, there's a lot of buoys, but it's not really in anybody's way yeah. because you don't go well, there because of the rocks. Other than kayak race, so the summer well, fall. And yeah. we, other than potentially 300 kayakers, 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 kayakers went to those buoys, and I, I was afraid yeah. of catching one anyway. Yeah, other than potentially. <laughs> So I was going in a motorboat or a sailboat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go no sense, just those kayakers. Yeah. Um, but I don't think, at least based on what I understand of the kind of habitat um, that kelp farming would require, I don't think we really have that sort of habitat in Darien town waters because it needs to be deep enough so that they don't get exposed to wave action, which deep enough being like 25 or 30 feet deep. Mm. And there's not really that much of that deep water in our town waters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, the only place that could be is sort of like in the entrance to Scotts Cove, out, you know, south of the entrance. But that's, there's too much traffic, boat traffic there. So I don't think we have eminent kelp farms in Darien just because of the physical characteristics of our town waters. Don't disagree with that, but I think already a point we, we mentioned is, you've, I think, brought it up originally. Um, I, I don't know if they mark these things well. Uh, so, like for example, the Stanford one. Yeah. Um, I, it doesn't. You can't see the buoys very well, and it's sort of in the way. That's tr that's yeah. true. Stanford. And, and, and I, you know, um, when I was in the kayak race, and we were going so hard, I I didn't have time to see if I was, you know, hitting a loop or something like that, and I, I didn't want to flip over. I was, you know, really out of breath by the time I was going through them. So I sort of bothered that I was going through three thousand of these things. And I sort of wanted to see I was coming upon them quicker. Um, so, you know, it wasn't in my five foot draft sailboat, but still. Um, so, I, I'm not sure if anyone's telling them, hey, mark these things like this or that. So, there's things that's already affecting our populations yeah. here. Um, yeah. Anyway, but that was it for me. Um, a, a plethora of stuff. So, and I'm working on uh, speakers, and we'll be heard a couple of them are lined up, and we'll keep on trying to get more. Can we have Krista? Erosia Bannock for one specific date from Department of Agriculture. Didn't she agree to I speak in maybe May or I heard you discuss it with her when we were at the Shellfish Commission, but I uh, or bring it up, but I didn't. I thought I'd sent you an email. Oh, I've missed it then, sorry. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Thank you. Tom? It's quiet season for me. I just need about 60, 70 people to fill out their renewal applications. <laughs> so how does that work? Do you cut them off after a certain date? Or? Yes. March 15th. Right. Just curious. And I wait Get a it in. Then I wait a couple of days because they all panic. And yeah, we have one guy <laughs> calls today. Is anybody in this room behind? I'm trying to remember if I Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it from Moines or Slips or both? I don't do Slips. These are Moines. Town Moines. 
Tom, what's going to happen to the fore and aft moorings up north of the boat club? I'm trying to eliminate those as, as best as possible. Um, they're just a pain. Because no, no, people don't want them? No, people, uh, you know, they've got people that don't want to give it up. Um, but it's just uh, the border is getting very, very shallow on both sides of the, uh, of the channel, if you will. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, they're smaller boats, they're under 20 feet, yeah. um, out astern, and it's just, uh, some people don't want to give them up until they get a slip at the boat club or something, but, right. um, I haven't put any new, net new back there in a couple of years, just for that purpose to try to eliminate it, and then when, when I do eliminate it, I'll go in and get over it all the hardware. Right, but why do you want to eliminate it? Just curious, I mean, if people want, want and don't mind to have a shallow, shallow one. Because at the, from almost all, everybody I put back there comes back to me and says, you know, you didn't tell me about this. And I said, oh, I was well, very clear. Full disclosure, I'm sure. About this. I knew about it when I had my boat back there. So did I. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so. I mean, I grew up with that, that you had to follow the tide mm -hmm. for getting right. on and off. I'd, you weren't launching your boat on a new moon, you know, mm -hmm. low yeah. tide. It's sort of like, that you're aware of the ocean, I sort of. Right. Well, that's a good thing, though. You actually paid attention to the tides. <laughs> so, um, okay. Tom, you know, a couple of years ago, the Parks and Recreation Commission was approached about putting a camera on top of the bathhouse at Pear Tree. It was someone from the boat club, I think. And the, uh, what was you? What, what? Did that ever happen? Oh, okay. No. Okay. No, I'm trying should, to, like, find the website on the town. Put, the, uh, put one at the Neurotin Yacht Club in the... Uh, in the, the Dairy and Pope Club. But funding didn't come through. It was going to be a grant. Wasn't there also an objection by the residents that they'd have full time cameras trained on? Yeah, I, think we, I think we handled that because it, it was so purely focused. If the boat club is easy, and then the uh, Northern Yacht Club was going to be angled correctly, so it was just going to go out to the main harbor. It's uh, uh, a good idea. Uh, advisory committee wants to, commission wants to uh, fund it. <laughs> How much did it cost? Was it? It was, it, it, the setup was the expensive part. It was like six or seven thousand dollars to set it up. Hmm. The installation was, was, the, was the problem. You think that there'd be an angle with the Marine Police at some point? No. Security of boats that they might find a way in their budget? We don't have a problem with the security of boats. And the boat club does have a camera uh, for the moored, for the uh, slip boats that they have in slips. Right. Okay. David? Shellfish. Um, I met uh, at Bill's suggestion. Um, it was February 8th in Milford, Roger Freight, Jr. and Sr., along with Dave Carey. Uh, we've had quite a bit of back and forth um, with um, the Freights over some different issues that have come up, and um, the people at the Department of Agriculture are often extraordinarily difficult uh, to get a hold of. So Bill suggested, and I think it was a very good suggestion, that we have a face-to-face, -face, which we did. We talked about uh, three different things, um, first of which was Scott's Cove. The freights were allowed to harvest in Scott's Cove in 2017. Um, they had some issues with their vessel, which had them harvesting. We gave them a couple of extensions into the beginning of 2018. We were the beneficiary of 10% of their harvest and got another probably 25 or 30 bushels that we put on our recreational beds. And in discussing, you know, what the right frequency for harvesting that would be, um, we agreed with David Carey that it probably ought to be be rested for two years, so we told them they couldn't go back in there until 2020. Um, so we've revised... But did they push back on that a lot? Or oh, they, they pushed back on that. Um, yeah. 
but they and so um, and I think part of their challenge is that in a day like today where it's super windy outside you don't want to be out in the middle of the sound on a boat I think you get pounded out there and so they said listen this is kind of the only place um, you know we can really get out of the wind and, 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 and work uh, to harvest clams so David Carey uh, revised his thoughts and said, hey, well, why don't we try giving you up to 25 days a year in Scott's Cove um, to harvest clams. And we'll you know, kind of look at it again next year. So that's what we've agreed to. The town will get 10% uh, of that harvest for our recreational beds. And the one thing that I learned that I didn't know is that the Department of Agriculture has put GPS tracking technology on every commercial shell fishing boat um, that works in Connecticut. So you'll know exactly how much time they're spending in Scotts Cove or anywhere else and <coughs> where they're going in there because it's all real time. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So, can they turn um, it off? Huh? what's that? Can they, can't they turn it off? I, I have no idea. That's the only I... GPS on Freight's boat. What's that? <laughs> that's the only GPS on Freight's boat. That's a GPS thing. Because he doesn't, I, I don't think they have GPS on there. I don't know. You would think they would. <laughs> okay. Well, there's some tracker for them. So then the, uh, the second uh, thing that we talked about um, was the Darien co-management bed. Our three-year lease with Tim Kramer expired, I believe, September 30th, when Bill and I met with uh, Jamie Stevenson. That was one of our topics of discussion. Uh, she uh, advised that we should direct that um, lease to, to Roger for the next uh, three years. Um, not permanently his, but maybe it rotates amongst uh, other commercial shell fishermen over time. But uh, So we have executed a three-year lease beginning January 1st um, for Roger Freight Jr. and Sr. to have that. Uh, in exchange, we get, as we had with Tim Kramer, 50 bushels of clams a year for our recreational beds. So, same basic agreement that we've had in the past. Do uh, you think that's going to be too many? You, you said that the clams were sort of so easy you could just pick them up. Do you think it's going to be too many? I talked to um, the Department of Aquaculture um, about that, and I don't think it's a problem. Um, you know, the, the, the sense that I got from them was unless they're just all clumped on top of each other and unable to get down in the mud and, and start kind of pumping water, that you're fine. And I've spent enough time rooting around in the different beds clamming that, that that's there's still not, plenty around not the right. issue. I mean, there are plenty of clams in there. I mean, there's the, you know, it's not difficult to find them, but I don't think they're lacking habitat or whatever the right terminology is. So, so dairy income management bed, that's done for the next three years. Uh, the third thing we talked about was uh, the clumps. Um, and I think the best way to describe that conversation is that we uh, kind of all agreed to disagree on uh, any outcome there. Dave Carey said that he'd like to um, undertake a project to go through the, the maps dating back to the dawn of time with the Revolutionary War and the Darien archives. Um, he said that he thinks that's a six-month project. Um, so. My guess is that between lack of funding and time and bigger fish to fry, that, that probably never happens, but he seems well-intentioned to want to take it on at some point. Yeah. But I mean, bring it into his ab office. Ab absent that um, being done, there will be no, I think, alternate resolution to the, the clumps issue, which is that Tim Kramer essentially has control over that piece of property. Or, piece at the bottom. Of yes, the where are the clumps? So the clumps are right outside of Darien Harbor and um, to the west of the channel. Yes. The show off of Long Neck Point? Off to oh, the I'm west sorry. of Long Neck Point. Okay, fine. So right, it's right the rocks that you see, right? As you oh, go out the channel. Okay, fine. Get right on the other there's side three, of the rocks west of the There's right. three clumps of the rocks. Yeah. That's what What's a clump? 
It's the, just a, it's the colloquial name for the three rocks, groups of rocks, oh. that are right to the uh, west of the channel. Right. As if you, you don't know we're there and it's high tide, you can really record No, it. I know oh, yeah. where the rocks are. I never heard of them. <laughs> it's that's the most fought over clam beds in the area. And that's the truth. <laughs> oh, well, there are some clam, yes, there are some clam beds that are, I think, just south of there. Or maybe just north, west. maybe north. But they're near there. They're all that are I called think it's the clouds. Yeah. The piece that's and there's been a dispute. Disputed. disputed. Anyway, so we, we could talk for hours about okay. the dispute. Okay. Right. That's the right so I think we, yeah. As long as Roger doesn't pull out a shotgun, we're, we're fine. <laughs> so I think, uh, so we, anyway, we had a very nice meeting. It was all cordial. Um, and I think we made some good progress um, in some issues that had been outstanding for a little bit. So that was all good. And he brought he brought his son, right? So yeah. it was both the right yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, so then uh, the only other thing that we ought to talk about, and there's really not too much to say, Bill, unless you have some things that you want to uh, mention. Uh, the, the two of us attended the annual gathering of shellfish commissions um, in, in New Haven uh, in, in January. I'd love to tell you that I have some big takeaways. I, I always feel like it's something that's worth going to, maybe at a high level. You learn maybe more than anything about some of the environmental issues that we talk about at some frequency here, impacting the sound more broadly and sometimes shellfish. Um, specifically, I always come away from it learning something, but um, that I, don't, good. I, I don't think there's anything that's worth really diving into in great detail here. I didn't have any great takeaways, but it's a room full of people who really care. I mean, they're they're focused on the coast, and they've got backgrounds both on the science side and the regulatory side, and a lot of them shell fishermen at one point. I, it's a pretty neat crowd, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, so it's worth going. Do they, they have a raw bar? <laughs> no raw bar. You get a sandwich bar. and a sandwich, uh, <laughs> some coffee. Um, so, you know, I, we should continue doing it every year. Um, and. Tom went last year, and maybe we rotate somebody else through uh, in 2020. That's all I have. All right. Uh, water quality. So um, these are the end of season reports. Uh, I, I think I sent this around to you guys. I'm not sure, but it's a hard copy anyway of the um, Board of Selectmen end of season paper on the Unified Water Study. So if I didn't, you're getting a hard copy now. And then Save the Sound came out with their report card. So they're a nice tandem set. So if you both all want to take uh, one of each, that's fine. And, and can someone make sure Kim gets a set? Oh, thank you. This, yeah, so. yeah, does anybody have an update on the uh, on the Lighthouse project? I was just going to ask that. Green flag and what's yeah. going on. We, shall we ask for them to come in again and give us a... <laughs> no, I'm just curious. It's made a lot of progress. I think they've taken care of all the steel. Done them, the steel work okay. around yeah. the base. Yeah, that was pretty. Yeah, I, I see barges go up next to it every now and then. Yeah. Um, I mean, if we keep on bringing them in, I think it helps increase the odds of you get invited to the opening party. <laughs> <laughs> so I would really like to go to cocktail hour out there on that little thing. You can. All you have to do is <laughs> contribute. You can see after one of your meetings there. I think that'd be great. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, they came in like uh, sometime last year. Probably a rough time of year and making progress out there. Yeah. Yeah, today was not a good day out there. Today was not a good day out there. The other thing on the water quality wanted to bring up, and um, there's not a lot on this yet, but you know, we've been um, uh, trying to figure out what we do on non point source pollution. And I think we all agree that's an area we'd like to push forward on, but we don't quite know how. Uh, and something has popped up um, via a funding opportunity. Um, I saw a um, advertisement to get something called the 319 grant, which is a grant for water quality projects associated with uh, watershed-based plans, WBPs. And uh, it sounded sort of interesting, and um, so we pursued it a little with uh, the two women who were here talking to us about nitrogen, excess nitrogen, that's Holly Drinkuth and, uh, Drinkuth and um, Sarah Crosby. And they knew all about it. They knew all about watershed-based plans. And it's how Sarah gets her grants to uh, do the water quality monitoring in Norwalk Harbor. Um, it's what funds uh, 
the Nature Conservancy's outreach efforts and the towns in the east side of Connecticut when they came and talked to us about the outreach efforts and the surveys, those are funded by 319 grants, all based on the designation of a given areas of watershed based plan. Um, and so that a lot of activity can happen under this, this designation, um, we started to try to figure out, uh, by we I mean Flip and I, we had a, a um, meeting with uh, uh, David Knopf, who actually was the recipient of the 319 grant, um, incidentally, for <coughs> came under a watershed-based plan, and was asking him about the values of doing it. It's a big bureaucratic exercise, um, but the values of doing it for the Neroten River and or Goodwise River, um, and the benefits we might see from doing that in the process entailed. Turns out there's been one done on um, Five Mile River, and our town, and uh, Norwalk, was there another town involved? Or just you came. You came. You came. Three, yeah, three, three, there were three signatures, weren't there? So, uh, our town, New Cain, and Norwalk signed a joint um, compact, if you will, establishing a, water -based, a watershed-based plan for the uh, Five Mile River, and Jamie was a signatory to that back in 2012. And so we're going to try to figure out what, you know, what the promises of that plan were and what's resulting and, and how it could help us um, tackling excess nutrients. So, um, I don't know, do you have more to add to that? Or? No, I mean, I think it's generally the, the, the watershed-based plan for, that we saw for uh, Sasco Creek right. Westport, in Westport um, was actually super interesting document, like a 150-page long tome, um, but talking about the history of the watershed and all the different land uses and points of pollution and the animals and plants and every, it was like an encyclopedic analysis of the watershed. Um, I, don't, I don't know how much it costs to have that get put together. There's a consultant who does that sort of thing. And, and he's paid for by uh, Connecticut Deep. So you can apply for Connecticut Deep to fund your application to become a watershed-based plant. So, so it's kind of interesting to just, to, at the very least, to develop a, an extensive database about uh, regarding each of the watersheds in town. But I think the thing that Bill and I were talking about is sort of like the from a cost benefit point of view, what you know, there's really interesting publications, but what actually happens as a result of them? And yeah. I think that's unclear to us at this point, uh, just because we don't know. The, the, the general concept would be it, it sets up like a, a base or foundation um, from which you can do activities and get funding. So, um, you know, let's talk about the the. Um, demonstration lawn with the buffer riparian buffer and stuff and how would we do that you know we, we'd have to either do the work ourselves fundraise ourselves get somebody to give us grants uh, and then do another project somewhere else you'd have to you know do it yourself get fundraising well if you got designation as a watershed based plan for let's say the Neroten River the projects that you think up on that river that would be under the general um, goals of the plan would be um, uh, eligible to get funding for 319 grants. So like you might establish the plan for the Roten River this year um, and you designate water quality is important and um, other elements of, of uh, stewardship of a river being important. And in subsequent years you then ask for 319 grants to attack those individual things. So it presents sort of this foundation upon which you then seek further grants and undertake further actions versus trying to do things piecemeal. Um, so hopefully it opens up a funding source and a, and a sort of program of action and you get buy-in. Like if we did the Roten, we'd have to have uh, Stanford and New Canaan and Darien sign a compact which would say, hey, we're all going to do something together. So you can sort of see it's sort of big. You got to open your arms up wide and try to get a hold of this thing. But once you get it in place, it sort of can enable you to do more things than normally. At least that's the... The hope. So and then I guess it would also give you sort of a little bit of a leg to stand on if you were trying to go upstream a little bit, like you were saying, and trying to attack different points of contamination and things like that. You'd have sort of more leverage to. Yeah, you get you get people having 
all good thoughts, they join on paper before there's any real costs to their actions because this is the right way people want to go. And then when you point out a particular project years later and it's difficult to exercise or, or attack, you've got that goodwill to hopefully yeah, generate the, the momentum and common effort. So, uh, but that's also the bureaucratic hurdle you've got to get over at the beginning, which is some there may be people who don't want to like rock the boat and you don't want to create a lot of investigation of problems that they, they have to fix. <laughs> yeah. But what I, what I liked about it for our commission, without knowing where this goes, um, what I liked about it for our commission is like, I frankly don't see anyone going around, uh, from us, going around and knocking on doors, taking surveys, um, having a public outreach education effort like the Nature Conservancy does. You know, they're, they're made for that. That's an organization which hires people to go out and take, you know, do all that stuff, public outreach. And if we had a watershed-based plan and we got a 319 grant for doing public outreach, we'd hire them to do it for us. You know, you get 15, 20,000 and you say, Nature Conservancy, outreach to Darien. Use the programs you've developed in those Connecticut towns and do it here. And I can see us as a committee, you know, exacting that, um, those, those policy steps, doing those policy steps a lot easier than I can see us knocking on doors and, you know, doing that groundwork. That's not what we do. So, um, so it, it, to me, it makes some sense to march down that direction. Could our outreach be less surveys and more making recommendations to people, saying this, the committee has sort of met with different professionals and come up with, you know, goals to reduce the amount of fertilizer people use by X percent or or the timing that they do it and say this is sort of, this is our recommendation and we're reaching out to you, you know, based on these findings that we've had. Well, this is where we swung back to, I thought you had a good handle on this when Holly and Sarah were here. We need sort of like scientific proof to have a black and white standard and then you could say, hey, here's what needs to be done. Here's the regulation or the ordinance or the strong recommendation of the town and then you can, but, but we don't have those types of black and white standards. Yeah, that's the, the challenge with a lot of this non-point so source nutrient contamination is that it's, it's real time right now. The scientists are studying the issues. They're trying to develop understandings of how it actually gets into the water and what, what you would do to abate it. Um, or in, in some cases, even how do you measure it? Um, and there's not, when you say, okay, you know, because for instance, I thought, oh, it makes sense to require that there be a, a riparian buffer of some amount of space to just keep things from f flowing directly into streams. But then you start to say, well, how wide does that buffer need to be? And can I prove that it actually works? And there's not really any scientific guidance uh, out there right now as to either of those things. So, and you know, in a lot of the potential solutions to this, that's where you find yourself. There's, in fact, I, I think it's probably fair to say there are, you know, regulators within our town and within our state who are sympathetic to these sort of things, but until we can arm them with actual facts, or scientific studies, they can't really just do things. So it couldn't be it couldn't be more of a best practices kind of concept. Where you say there's there's no best practices really. I mean, I, I do think we've talked about one of them, fertilizer application. I think there is a growing consensus that applying fertilizer after September fifteenth is is does not help the the lawns and it is prone to being washed away because it's not being absorbed by the, the growing plants. So that is pretty clear, I think, these days, whether it's September 15th or September 1 or, you know, at the beginning of the fall, the grass, you know, stops absorbing the nutrients and anything you put on it gets washed away over the course of the winter rains and snows. Um, so that's that's the one area that I think, but and and there are people like the Nature Center, uh, sorry, the Nature Conservancy, 
that are starting to do the public awareness, uh, and and that's but that public awareness challenge on a fertilizer application is is complex when you think about what goes on because the lawn guys get paid by the application, so they get well. That's more Scott. Scott says it builds strong roots. Yes, so any time in the so fall. So you have the fertilizer, <laughs> Christmas you know, fertilizer companies and the lawn guys. Yeah. The homeowners, by and large, don't really understand what's going on, and all they want is a very green lawn. And so you don't have a natural alignment of interest there to say, oh, stop putting fertilizer up. So the, the turf doctor, April 8th and May 9th, isn't that kind of the purpose to be able to do what we're talking about, just to be able to come up with some hard facts? Yes, sir. although I don't think his, he's not in a place, I don't believe, where he's got a, a long list of hard facts. Okay. He's the guy who's actually doing the studies right now. The, the nice thing about the watershed-based plan is, um, this may be easy for me to say because I don't have a science background, um, but I, I don't know if um, like I'm ever going to get there on what's the right thing to do scientifically, or environmentally. And so the watershed-based plan basically is getting money to hire experts to do it for you. And who are the experts? You know, Sarah Crosby and the Nature Conservancy and uh, there's other consultants who drop in and they assess what the uh, current nitrogen load is, and I think a lot of it's modeling rather than actual live data, and what the um, target nitrogen loading should be, you know, three years hence or five years hence after mitigation measures. I don't think we're ever going to figure any of that stuff out here. I think if we can hook into some sort of conveyor belt which gives money to hire experts, I think that's probably our best shot at doing something that's sensible and current. Um, and that's, a, you know, again, a little of the hope of a watershed-based plan or approach that would be a little broader. Um, so. Anyway. Um, so I guess stay tuned on that, and anyone, uh, Rob's uh, raised his hand to be involved in some of this, and uh, anyone who else wants to join on some of this, I think, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, uh, water, uh, Unified Water Study sort of goes, it's sort of an operational thing that doesn't um, have a lot of exploratory elements to it. This will be, I think, the larger part of the water quality effort that we're doing, so uh, it's got room for more than just two or three people. So. If you get an interest in it, we'll just keep on informing you what you do, what we're doing. If you get an interest, jump in. So, um, the, uh, so I was just going to bring up three last things, and then if anyone else got anything else, we can open the floor. But um, I wanted to put a plug in for the Unified Water Study for recruiting for another one or two people for sampling. So we start in May and end in October every two weeks, and we're doing a third harbor this year. So we do Darien Harbor, we do Cove Harbor. And now we're going to do the Scott Ziegler Fish Island area. Um, and so that adds another, you know, 45 minutes to the sampling schedule. And probably won't do it all on a Saturday. We'll do two coves on Saturday morning and the Scott Cove Ziegler's area on Sunday morning. Go right by your house and wake you up. I'll wait. <laughs> Um, and so if anyone like, would like to join that second team, and we currently only have one person who would be on that team, I'm going to have to double. Um, but I, I do think we'll get another couple people from Scott Cove area. But if uh, anyone would like to join, we're, um, you know, conceivably could do something like, um, you know, you just take six sampling sessions uh, for three months, and then another team takes the last sampling sessions. So it's sort of fun um, to get out and, um, early in the morning, Saturday, 6 a.m. <laughs> Let me know if you're interested. Um, and then on the other, uh, why is it, sorry, just why is it um, Saturday six a.m. or you know, is there a certain schedule that has to abide by, or is it? Well, you, first of all, you, yeah, once you get into the schedule, you have to keep to it. That's okay. just the protocol. Of the uh, thing. Sure. But also, there's apparently a breathing of the oxygen levels, and so when you are hitting them at six a.m. in the morning, they're at their nadir, so yep. um, they like to measure them at the same time. Sure. So. That's, it's it's got to be within three hours of sunrise, got it. so it can be seven or eight. I was but, just curious if there was yeah. a reason for that, or if it was. Yeah. I, I like getting up early. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
And we said it like uh, as fall came on, we were doing it at seven o'clock. Uh, yeah. Because we got our two harbors down. Actually, we got the process down pretty fast. Yeah. We stopped anchoring because we noticed we weren't drifting out of the GPS range, so <laughs> and we could do it quick enough. So that saved a lot of time. <laughs> so that's uh, on the other uh, two items on the list here, these are also volunteer things. Um, we have not really been, I think, keeping abreast as a committee of dock applications. I don't know how many we've missed, and we may not, maybe haven't missed many, but I think there's been... I get, a, I get requests for approval on every one of those. Okay. We used to discuss them in the um, commission more. In Darien or dock applications in Darien? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah, we used to... Yeah, I haven't seen many. Well, it's maybe that they haven't come up. I there know. haven't been a lot, yeah. but yeah, I, it's also so unclear... Was, uh, Kind of what our role is. Role is even. Well, as planning as it used to go. Planning and zoning gets it, and is meant to make sure it all happens in accordance with the, the state and federal rights. Right. And so you're probably doing that element now. As a commission, though, we were a, another check that that was actually working correctly, and I like that just because it kept us in tune with what was happening on the water. Okay. I'll go back to the same thing I said before. You, you're an advisory commission. You would have to be advisory, advising the selectman's office, parks and rec, building and grounds, and the harbor masters already reviewed, reviewed all of those. Well, it's in our purview to have a, a voice in here also. You know, I, I, again, I think it's sort of good for us to know what's going on. The commission used to do it regularly. Never, not since I've been here. Well, I've been a little longer then, because we used to do it regularly. And there used to be someone, um, as a past practice, who was monitoring, and this is back in, uh, Frank Kemp did this in 2014. Anyway, um, Frank Kemp showed simply where you sign up to get the deep notices. And I had signed up for this and somewhere it went away. I haven't tried to re-sign up. I still get them. Yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah, right. There's not that many. There, I mean, okay. there's not that many that are enduring. Well, maybe it's just me but missing the, them. Then. The, I mean, there's one new doc going in next, so, sometime it'll be there in time for next summer, I think that will be a little bit shocking in a sense of um, it's on going to be on the west side, the west facing coast of Long Neck Point, but it's going to be different from every other dock and it's going to have a boat lift on it. Um, so this will be the first, at least that's my understanding, this will be the first boat lift in Darien waters. But there's, a, there's another couple, but maybe they're in back in Scott Cove up the creek or something. I've seen a couple. Um, I, I haven't well, seen a, those. There's a couple. Uh, uh, I guess it's not a boat ramp. They, they have the, there are a couple up in um, the, the netherlands of Scott Cove. That's okay, so area. I haven't seen them, but this, this will be front and center, you know, to everybody going in and out of the harbor with full kind of lifting a big center console up and down. How okay. that you know? I, I don't know, um, but it's a decent size setup, um, and so that. But again, I I don't know. It doesn't seem to me whether I like that or not personally. It doesn't right. seem to me that that's some. It's not clear to, to me how we would have a point of view on that if it's passed through P and Z and deep, both of which it has to obviously go through. Right. Well, my. Well, my view was, the original request was that someone make sure they're surfacing and coming to the uh, commission meeting. So if that's already happening, maybe it's just me who's been missing them. Um, but I was going to see if someone would, like, stick their hand up to make sure they always are brought up. And if you're already looking at them, maybe could, looking at them. could you just bring them up then when they surface? Sure. Um, okay. I mean, the, in the past, we've had some good discussions on them about how far they extend and, you know, are they doing it right? And I... Again, all of those decisions and discussion points have already been made by the appropriate people in the town. Park, uh, building and grounds, ZBA. So if ZBA has said, you know, the document I'm going to give you that it's going to be a 50-foot ramp with a boat lift, and everybody, every other agency in the town has said, okay, I, I don't see what this committee needs to improve. But even the towns, my, my understanding of the process is that the town's approvals are actually moderately perfunctory and that they are largely based on 
the applicant having gone through the proper deep application right. process. Because you have and to remember that the town waters start at 14 feet mean low tide off the court off the edge of the water. I guess I so would, the state owns is in control, right. i.e. the harbor master. That's why you know it's 14 but feet I, up. I guess Tom, the point I'm trying to make is even what whatever the town whatever PNZ does, I believe it's PNZ, which is the board that approves docks locally. Um, I, you know, it's, it's really deep who has the substantive review and application. They're looking at the construction of the dock. They're looking at the site. And they're the people who, are, that, 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 that is the true. town that does call. not then do that again. Their, they do some check, though. There's, there's their some review is more, I think, that, that the applicant has gotten the proper <coughs> approvals from the, right, and that it's otherwise in compliance with zoning requirements, which Sorry, are not, in, in a sense, substantive. They're just process. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, but I, my point is, I think, so this doesn't sound like it's going to be a big bother because it's not going to come up a lot. But my point is, I think, that the process check with the commission is worth it also. If just for us to sensitize, be aware of what's going on in the harbor, um, exceptions any, happening in that time. I don't have any problem sharing it. You have a timing issue. You know, I get these reports and I'm asked and, to return it back in five days. And then in which case we, we mess it. That's or or you, you actually have to respond. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, okay. As the harbor master, I, have, I get one. I just right. got one the other day. Okay. Well, so the oh, no, question is why, why, you know, why, why are you needing to respond at all anyway? Because it's already approved by deep, so it's. I think you know, you having your eyes on it makes me more comfortable because you've got some sensitivity to the harbor. Yes. So, so that's good that you're uh, a timely look at it, and we won't be a timely look. But to the extent we can be on a given one, would you pr just bring I, it up I, with if us? If I get one, I'll bring it to the board. Yeah, to the commission. Super. That's super. I got. I think it just keeps everyone but aware the, of what's happening. It, it, I don't. The because um, I get these notices from deep. Yeah, I'm going to um, up again, then. I, I on these I emails, yeah. but inevitably, when you actually read the application, it's interesting to read to just understand what's being built where. But it's always there's a paragraph in there that says Deep is um, opting to waive the public hearing on this process. Ninety-nine percent of the time, and, and you know, in fact, that that one doc. Um, a year ago or yeah. two years ago, they yeah. actually thought people thought was worth weighing in on. We got the powers to be in town to weigh in on it, and still deep wouldn't hold a public hearing, and there was still nothing to do. Not in town. They offered to hold a public hearing up in Hartford, and nobody could go from the local. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, they, no, I thought no, they, they offered. Have, no, we we put the petition together and got got them to the hold. We got enough signatures. But they said, okay, it'll be Wednesday morning uh, at uh, oh, you know, up in Hartford, and we were like, well, who's got time for that? Yeah. <laughs> so it's the the process isn't really set up for us to have any practical yeah. input. Yeah, I hear you. Is the I mean, so it's interesting to look at these things, and I'm. Everybody should. It's a, you could just well, sign up on the DEEP website to get these notices. Every day I get one. Yeah, well, I'm going to go back and sign up. For some reason I've dropped off. But there's, it's just, yeah. it hasn't been kind of actionable yeah. in the no, past. I, I hear, I hear in that. So, you know, if it starts to be a nuisance, then we'll just drop any look at it. But that, that would be helpful to stop. If, you're getting, if, you can get, if you can get the reports, then there's no need for us to talk about them. But. Um, okay. We'll just see, it, see how it goes. But. I haven't gotten one in a couple of weeks. I got one in about three or four weeks here. Yeah, it doesn't sound like we'll be a big thing again. All right, so let's keep an eye on that stuff. Yes, yeah, I haven't gotten one in a while. Uh, I think I get them almost every day, but they're it's statewide notices, right? right, right. right? So it's Stratford. Only the ones in Darien come out. Yeah. I'll, I'll Maybe send, I'll send once this around. Every I'll send the four months or so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I have to. Re I don't know why I'm not getting. So I'll, I'll resign and I'll send it around for people interested. Good. All right. Um, the only other thing I had was um, our website. So I was looking for a volunteer to, to update the website, which is basically uh, getting to somebody in the town, the IT person, um, to try to get some improvements to our website. 
and I'm not thinking big fancy stuff, but um, putting the email addresses, such as is done with um, Parks and Rec, um, the information is not updated, uh, so we still have Audrey on, for example, and uh, Rob, weren't you uh, undecided or independent rather than a Republican? I forget. Independent. Yes, yeah, so you're incorrectly listed. Um, David's a, a U, which is probably undecided. Unaffiliated. Unaffiliated, sorry. We've got decisions in your head. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's incorrect information, hasn't been updated for the for, um, flip and eye changing, um, which is probably what made me say this isn't right. <laughs> so, but uh, Also, uh, Tom, the, there's a 2015 Harbor survey results on that, I know, noticed that you had put on that. And I was curious if you were going to do that for the recent 2018 one, because you had written a letter to the selectmen. So that was another thing that I thought was a nice updating for resident coming on town and wondering what's happening with our harbor. I can I mean we I can provide somebody with that data. I mean I I probably have that too. My point was if you didn't object to that being put on the website, I thought that was a good ad. Nope. Um, you know likewise we might want to put our charter on there. Um, so the thought for someone to volunteer to do this, they might look at some of the other commission websites and see what they've been doing. Do they have a couple things that we should try to emulate. Who's got administrator credentials? No idea. What was the question here? Who has the administrator credentials? It's, uh, it's I don't I'll call Linda. As I, yeah. I was going to say, call Linda. <laughs> Does yeah. someone That's always the answer, call Linda. I, I don't think we have, we don't physically. They're not going to give us Oh, the, we tell them what to put in and we don't actually do the yeah, work press. I think that's oh, yeah, 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 that's where it works. I think what I'm asking is someone might survey <laughs> some of the other commissions and see if there's any ideas that should be emailed out to the rest of us to see if we have an interest in boosting up our website. Otherwise, if they could just uh, correct some of the incorrect things, um, maybe put our charter on, which I can email to people. Um, Officer Mulcahy, Mulcahy is not listed as a uh, ex officio member, which I believe he is. So that's another incorrect thing. So, so if any, would, would someone volunteer just to put their eye on it and look at other commissions' websites for I don't think it would take you much time. So, anyway, and again, everyone's okay on having their email address listed on their, their, their nct.gov form. Yeah. I just think that would be a nice outreach. Everybody needs to make sure they know I what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to remember a long sense. I texted Town IT to make sure that we can get all the passwords reset. Mm. Okay, so, that's, so you, you handle that because you're yeah. probably better at that than me. So that was good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the I question, know. I guess, just thinking oh, about no, that, I that I would ask is: You should have been. Do you do you really want to put everybody's email on it, or do you just want to have like yours, the chairperson? Because you know, there's not there is not a lot of traffic, and it you might as well magnify it towards you so that there's a higher That's likelihood that you actually true. look at it and yeah. see it. No, that may be a good Rather point. than if it's everybody and we get one email every five years, which is probably not going to be too much off, other than our internal stuff yeah. of scheduling. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, if you guys just in terms of the are. point of contact for outsiders, should go to the chairman, I would think, rather than just I see the point. anybody. Yeah. yeah. You all think that's a good idea, I'm fine on that. Yeah. I'll show you the interesting up. stuff. It'll take less room on the website. All right, well, any other business? We've got a couple more minutes if anyone wants to bring something up. And move to adjourn. Second. 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 We're adjourned. All right. Thank you.